Well, in the endless sort of struggle that neurobiologists have, I think, in terms of free will, determinism, all of that, um, you know, my feeling has always been there's not a whole lot of free will out there, and if there is, it's in the least interesting places and getting more sparse all the time. Um, but there's this whole new realm of neuroscience that I've been thinking about, starting to do research on, that throws in another element of things going on below the surface affecting our behavior. And it's got to do with this utterly bizarre world of parasites uh, manipulating your behavior. So it turns out this is like not all that surprising. There's all sorts of parasites out there that get into some organism, and what they need to do is parasitize the organism and increase the likelihood that they, the parasite, will be fruitful and multiply. And in some cases, they could manipulate the behavior of the host. And some of these are pretty astounding. There's there's this barnacle that rides on the back of some crab and is able to inject estrogenic hormones into the crab if the crab is male. And at that point, the male's behavior becomes feminized. The male crab digs a hole in the sand for his eggs, um, except he has no eggs, but the barnacle sure does and has just parasitized gotten this guy. There's, there's other ones where wasps parasitize caterpillars and get them to defend the wasps' nests for them, and, you know, extraordinary examples. So the one my lab is beginning to focus on is one in the world of mammals and parasites changing mammalian behavior. So it's got to do with this parasite, this protozoan toxoplasma. So if you're ever pregnant, if you're ever around anyone who's pregnant, you know you immediately get skittish about cat, cat, scat, cat feces, cat droppings, cat bedding, cat everything, because it could carry toxo. And you do not want to get toxoplasma into a fetal nervous system. It's a disaster. Normally, though, the normal life cycle for toxo is one of these amazing sort of bits of natural history. Toxo can only reproduce sexually in the gut of a cat. Comes out in the cat feces, feces get eaten by rodents, and toxo's evolutionary challenge at that point is to figure out how to get rodents inside cat stomachs. Now, it could have done this in really unsubtle ways you know, cripple the, the rodent or some such thing. Toxo instead has developed this amazing capacity to alter innate behavior in rodents. You take a lab rat, you take a lab rat who is 5,000 generations into being a lab rat since an ancestor actually ran out around in the real world, and you put some cat urine in one corner of their cage, and they're going to move to the other side. Completely innate hardwired version to the smell of cats, to cat pheromones. And you take a toxo-infected rodent, and they're no longer afraid of the smell of cats, and in fact, they become attracted to it. The most damn amazing thing you can ever see, Toxo knows how to make cat urine smell attractive to rats. And rats go and check it out, and that rat is now much more likely to wind up in the cat's stomach. So this was reported by a group in the UK about half a dozen years ago, Toxo behavior people in this totally cool phenomenon, and well, not a whole lot was known about what toxin was doing in the brain. So ever since part of my lab has been trying to figure out what's the neurobiology of this. So the first thing is, you know, it's for real. The rodents, rats, mice really do become attracted to cat urine when they've been infected with toxo. And you would say, okay, well, this is a rodent doing just all sorts of screwy stuff because it's got this parasite turning its brain into Swiss cheese or something. It's just non-specific behavioral chaos, but no, these are incredibly normal animals. Their olfaction is normal, their social behavior is normal, their learning and memory is normal, all of that. So this is not just a generically screwy animal. So you say, okay, well, it's not that, but Toxo seemingly knows how to destroy sort of fear and anxiety circuits. But it's not that either, because these are rats who are still innately afraid of bright lights. They're nocturnal animals. They're afraid of big open spaces. You can condition them to be afraid of novel things. 
the system works perfectly well there, somehow Toxo can laser out this fear pathway, this aversion to predator odors. So we go and start looking at this, and I had this amazing postdoc guy named Ajay Vyas who joined my lab and decided to gamble his entire career on whether it's possible to figure out what's going on. And so the first thing you do is you introduce Toxo into a rat, and it takes about six weeks for it to migrate from its gut up into its nervous system. And at that point, you kind of look, where has it gone in the brain? It forms these cysts, these sort of latent encapsulated cysts, and it winds up all over the brain. So that was like deeply disappointing. But then you look at how much winds up in different areas of the brain, and it turns out Toxo preferentially knows how to home in on the part of the brain that is all about fear and anxiety, a brain region called the amygdala. The amygdala is where you do your fear conditioning. The amygdala is what's hyperactive in people with post-traumatic stress disorder. The amygdala is all about pathways of predator, aversion, all those sorts of things, and Toxo knows how to get in there. Next, we then see that Toxo can take the dendrites, the branching cables that neurons have to connect to each other, and it shrivels them up in the amygdala. It's disconnecting circuits. You wind up with fewer cells there. So this is this parasite that is unwiring this stuff in the critical part of the brain for fear and anxiety. Okay, that's really interesting. That doesn't tell us a thing, though, about why it's only predator version that's been knocked out, whereas fear of bright lights, etc., is still in there. It knows how to find that particular circuitry. Okay, so what's going on from there? What's it doing? Because it's not just destroying this fear avert aversive response, it's creating something new. It's creating an attraction to the cat urine. So here's where this gets utterly bizarre. So you look at you know, circuitry in the brain, and there's a reasonably well-characterized circuit that activates neurons becoming metabolically active circuits where they're talking to each other. Um, reasonably well-understood circuit that's involved in predator aversion. And it involves neurons in the amygdala getting excited, neurons in the hypothalamus, some other brain regions. Very well-characterized circuit. Meanwhile, there's well-characterized circuits having to do with sexual attraction. And it happens, part of it courses through the amygdala, which is pretty interesting in and of itself, and those go off into different areas of the brain than the fear pathways. So you look now at a normal rat, and you expose them to cat urine, cat pheromones, and you know exactly as you would expect, they have a stress response, their stress hormone levels go up, and they activate this classical fear circuitry in the brain. Now you take a toxo-infected rat right around the time where they start liking the smell of cat urine, and you take them and you expose them to cat pheromones, and you don't get the stress hormone release. And what you get is the fear circuit doesn't activate normally, and the sexual arousal circuit activates a bit. In other words, Toxo knows how to hijack this sexual reward pathway. And you get males infected with Toxo and expose them to a lot of the rodent and the cat pheromones, and their testes get bigger. Somehow, this damn parasite knows how to make cat urine smell sexually arousing to male rodents, and they go and check it out. Totally amazing. So, on a certain level, you know, that explains everything. Aha, it takes over sexual arousal circuitry. This is utterly bizarre. At this point, we don't know what the basis is of the attraction in the females, something we're working on. So last totally crazy piece of the story, and this was some extremely nice work done by a group at Leeds in the UK, Glenn McConkie, and stuff we're picking up on collaboratively, which is looking at the Toxo genome. Okay, Toxo, it's a protozoan parasite. Toxo and mammals had a common ancestor the last time they did was, God knows, billions of years ago. And you look in the Toxo genome, and it's got two versions of a gene called tyrosine hydroxylase. And if you're a neurochemistry type, you would be leaping up in shock and excitement at this point. Tyrosine hydroxylase is the critical enzyme for making dopamine. 
the neurotransmitter in the brain that's all about reward and anticipation of reward. Cocaine works on the dopamine system, all sorts of euphorians do. Dopamine is about pleasure, attraction, anticipation, and the toxogenome has the mammalian gene for making the stuff. And it's got a little tail on the gene that targets, specifies that when this is turned into the actual enzyme, it gets secreted out of the toxo and gets into neurons. This parasite doesn't need to learn how to make neurons act as if they are pleasurably anticipatory. It takes over the brain chemistry of it all on their own. Okay, so again, that issue of specificity comes up. You know, look at closely related parasites to toxo. Do they have this gene? Absolutely not. Okay, so now look at the toxic genome and look at genes related to other brain messengers. Serotonin, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine, and you go through every single gene you could think of, zero. Toxo doesn't have them. Toxo's got this one gene, which allows it to just plug into the whole world of mammalian reward systems. And at this point, that's what we know. It is utterly cool. And of course, at this point, you then say, well, uh, what about other species? What does Toxo do to humans? And there's some interesting stuff there that's reminiscent of what's going on in rodents. Clinical dogma is you first get a toxo infection. Um, if you're pregnant, it gets into the fetal nervous system, huge disaster. Um, otherwise, you get a toxo infection, it has phases of inflammation, but eventually it goes into this latent asymptomatic stage, which is when these cysts form in the brain, which is in a rat, when it stops being anything boring like asymptomatic, that's when the behavior starts occurring. Interestingly, that's when the parasite starts making this tyrosine hydroxylase. So what about humans at this time point when supposedly toxo has become asymptomatic in them and a small literature is coming out now showing do neuropsychological testing on men who were toxo infected and they get a little bit impulsive in the sort of various tests of this. Um, women less so, and this may have some parallels perhaps with this whole testosterone uh, aspect of the story we're seeing. And then the truly astonishing thing, two different groups independently have reported that people who are toxo-infected have three to four times the likelihood of being killed in car accidents involving reckless speeding. In other words, you take a toxo-infected rat and it does some dumbass thing that it should innately be skittish about, which is go right up to cat smells. And maybe you take a toxo-infected human and they start having a proclivity towards doing dumbass things that we should be innately averse to, which is like having your body hurtle through space at high g-forces. And maybe this is uh, the same neurobiology. This is not to say that Toxo has evolved the need to get humans into cat stomachs. It's just, you know, sheer convergence. It's the same nuts and bolts neurobiology as us in the rodent and does the same thing. So this, I would guess, I mean, on a certain level, this is a protozoan parasite that knows no more about the neurobiology of anxiety and fear than 25,000 neuroscientists standing on each other's shoulders. And this is not a uh, rare pattern. You look at rabies virus, rabies knows more about aggression than we neuroscientists do. It knows how to make you rabid. It knows how to make you want to bite someone and have new particles of rabies in your saliva and pass it on this way. You know, the toxo story is, like, for me, like completely new terrain and totally cool, interesting stuff, just in terms of this individual problem. And maybe it's got something to do with treatments for phobias down the line or whatever it is to make it seem like anything more than just the coolest chi whiz thing possible. But no doubt it's also a tip of the iceberg of God knows what other parasitic stuff is going on out there. And even in the larger sense, God knows what other unseen realms of biology uh, make our behavior far less uh, autonomous than lots of folks would like to think. Okay, so humans with parasite infections like Toxo, um, big prevalence uh, in certain parts of the world. It's a higher prevalence in the tropics. 
uh, where typically more than 50% of people are infected, lower rates and more temperate zones for reasons I do not understand and do not choose to speculate on. France has really high rates of toxo-infection. I think in much of the developing world, it's bare feet absorbing it through soil where cats may have been. It's food that may not have been washed sufficiently and absorption through hands. You know, the, the usual sort of dismal routes why people in the developing world are more subject to all sorts of infectious stuff. They do. A couple of years ago, I sat down with a couple of the, the toxo docs over in our hospital who do the toxo testing in the, the OBGYN clinics. And they hadn't heard about this behavioral story, and isn't that cool and unexpected, and I'm going on about that. And suddenly, one of them jumps up, like flooded with 40-year-old memories, and says, I just remembered back when I was resident, I was doing a surgical rotation, surgical transplant rotation, and there was this old guy, surgeon, who said, you know, if you ever get organs from a motorcycle accident death, check the organs for toxo. I don't know why, but you find a lot of toxic with that. And you can see this guy was like in this rush of nostalgic memories of back when he was 25 and being told this weird factoid, ooh, people who've died in motorcycle accidents seem to have high rates of toxo. Utterly bizarre. Okay, here's something terrifying and not surprising. Mm -hmm. Someone who knows about toxic when the behavioral stuff is the US military. They're interested in toxo. Um, they're officially intrigued, and I would think they would be intrigued studying a parasite that makes mammals perhaps do things that everything in their fiber tells them not to because it's dangerous and ridiculous and stupid and don't do it, and suddenly with this parasite on board, it's a little bit more likely you go and do it. Who knows, but they are aware of toxo. The little science, and this is really an emerging field, there's been a handful of these really excellent papers from this group in the UK um, who obviously pioneered it. We've had a couple of papers out by now and we're cranking out more as fast as we can. Um, it's two groups that collaborate. Uh, one is Joanne Webster, who was at Oxford at the time that she first sort of saw this behavioral phenomenon. And I believe she's now at University College London. Um, and the other is Glenn McConkie at University of Leeds, and they're on this. They're, she's more of a behaviorist, he's more of an enzyme biochemist guy, and we're doing the neurobiology end of it. We're all talking lots. McConkie is coming to my lab on Monday to hang out, and so we'll see what we could find out. Well, so what does this mean? Um, you know, it may explain you know, some tragic feature of maladaptive behavior in rodents and, you know, it may be just utterly cool biology just in and of itself. It may tell us something about fear and phobias in humans, although that might be kind of a stretch. Oh, okay. One interesting additional thing about Toxo is there's a long-standing literature absolutely solidly shows there's a statistical link between Toxo infection and schizophrenia. It's not a big link, but it's solidly there. Schizophrenics have higher than expected rates of having been infected with toxo, and not particularly the case for other uh, related parasites. Uh, links schizophrenia, mothers had house cats during pregnancy. There, there's a whole literature with that. So where does that fit in? Two really interesting things, back to dopamine, that tyrosine hydroxylase gene that Toxo somehow ripped off from mammals, which allows it to make more dopamine. Dopamine levels are too high in schizophrenia. That's the leading suggestion of what neurochemically that's about. You take Toxo-infected rodents and their brains have elevated levels of dopamine. Final deal is, and this came from the Webster's group, you take a rat who's been toxo-infected and is now at this state where it would find cat urine to be attractive, and you give it drugs that block dopamine receptors, the drugs that are used to treat schizophrenics, and it stops being attracted to the cat urine. So there's some schizophrenia connection here with this. One of the things, any time Toxu has been sort of picked up in the media and the schizophrenia angle is brought in, the irresistible angle is the generic 
crazy cat lady with a you know living in the apartment with 43 cats and their mm -hmm. detritus and mm -hmm. you know, that's an irresistible one in terms of toxo psychiatric status cats but mainly again the same the point is exactly what you bring up which is god knows what stuff is lurking there now let's see i was out with my baboons last summer i'm not heading out there this summer kenya which is where my field site is has had a rough couple of years of mm -hmm. politics um, but in terms of the actual baboon work one of the areas where it's starting to go starting to head is this new very trendy subject in stress and disease you know what i study in the baboons is individual differences in stress if you're a wild baboon what does your social rank your personality your patterns of social affiliation have to do with who's got the high blood pressure and the rotten cholesterol levels and the, who's more vulnerable to the stress-related diseases. Um, so there's been a very interesting field emerging in the last half dozen years or so um, looking at one of those realms of biology where nobody on earth would have thought there would be effects of stress until the scientist UCSF Medical Center, Alyssa Eppel, um, thought that there might be a connection. Okay, so you've got chromosomes long strings of DNA, coding for your genes, all that, and at the ends of the chromosomes are these things called telomeres. The required by law metaphor is a telomere is like you got a shoelace and at the end of it you got the little plastic wrapping there and what does it do? It keeps the end of your shoelace from fraying and falling apart. And what's known is with every cycle of cell division, telomeres get a little shorter and when they finally get short enough, the cell stops dividing, the cell has become senescent. And for lots of people, this is controversial, but lots of people feel that this whole process of telomere shortening over time is the closest thing we have to a molecular calendar of aging going on in cells all over the place. Um, so what this study focused on was whether stress could accelerate the shortening of telomeres, accelerate the aging of chromosomes. So what do you typically do? You'll say, okay, let's get us some lab rats or let's get us some fruit flies or who knows what. And, you know, 20 years from now with enough data, we'll say, hmm, maybe this has something to do with humans. That's not what happened in this case. Incredibly striking. Um, the first study was done with humans with sort of the poster children of human chronic psychosocial stress the healthy, relatively young mothers of kids with horrible chronic illnesses. And these mothers are the primary caretakers, and this is like a devastating, you know, it's as stressful as life can be in some ways for humans. And what they went and did was look at these women and looked at their white blood cells, their lymphocytes, and their telomeres were prematurely shortened. And in an utterly rough calculation for every year of caring for this seriously ill child, approximately seven years worth of shortening of telomeres in there. And this is really quite striking. What's even more striking is it's pretty clear the likely pathway going from elevated levels of stress hormones to down at the level of chromosomes, these telomere things shortening. This is stress. This is psychosocial stress. This is going to bed each night wondering how long your child will live making your chromosomes get older faster. This is a pretty dramatic finding. So since then, this has really taken off as a subject, and there's now findings that major long-term clinical depression, you get accelerated aging of telomeres in your white blood cells, uh, some other work that my lab is starting up on that, in that area. So what I'm interested in with the baboons is, if you're a low-ranking baboon and you're, as we know, more likely to be marinating in stress hormone levels and stress-related disease, are your chromosomes getting older faster? So beginning to look at this whole issue of telomere biology in the baboons, and hopefully in a couple How of years I'll have an answer.